pleasure to welcome Jonathan Katz to this CASA Distinguished Lecture. Probably everyone knows Jonathan. He's one of the, the most well-known people working on crypto and security in general. And he's a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Maryland, which is probably one of the biggest centers in the US. And he was also the director of the Maryland Cybersecurity Center for more than five years. So he has uh, basically helped to, yeah, to start up this whole center. And we are very uh, happy that Jonathan is here today. He, or probably many of you know his uh, textbook in cryptography, probably also one of the uh, textbooks that most of our students know. And I think many also know the courses you teach online uh, with Coursera. Um, and I think there, Mary, um, many people from Maryland are involved. So I think this is actually a great resource that we also use. I'm referring to this also in my uh, in my courses because it's nice to uh, to have these videos on Coursera. So thanks a lot for providing these. He's also an uh, IRCR fellow, and he was named by the University of Maryland as a distinguished Schula scholar teacher in 2017, 2018, and then. For this whole ACM prestige, he recently was received the ACM SIGSEC Outstanding Contribu Contribution Award in 2019. So it's a pleasure to welcome you. And unfortunately, not in presence, but only via Zoom, but glad to be here. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, of course, it would be even better if I were there. Um, but nevertheless, it's great we have a chance to do this over Zoom. Um, I. Uh, asked in advance whether I would be able to give a, a whiteboard presentation. This is actually the first time I've done this for an invited lecture, um, but I figure, uh, first of all, with Zoom, it provides the opportunity to do something like this rather than having to prepare PowerPoint slides. But I'm hoping also that it'll be um, more interesting for the audience. Um, it'll, it'll force me to go a little bit slower. It'll make it a little bit more like a class, uh, perhaps. And uh, I'd like to encourage, I don't know if people have the ability to ask questions, but maybe if, um, uh, if pe people are welcome to ask questions, uh, if you can't do it by audio, you're welcome to put it in the chat and maybe uh, Thorsten can, can uh, let me know if there's any question in the chat so I can respond to it. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is some work related to, uh, generally speaking, uh, the intersection between secure computation and differential privacy. Um, this is joint work with uh, my collaborators, uh, Dove Gordon. Um, a PhD student, Mingyu Lang, and a postdoc, Zhao Yushu. And I didn't know in advance, actually, uh, what the background of the audience would be. Uh, I didn't even know exactly who would be showing up. And so roughly the first uh, 20 to 30 minutes of the talk, I think, are just going to be some background material related to uh, the general topics of secure computation and the differential privacy. So let me just set up the kind of problem that we're going to be looking at today. Um, what we're going to be looking at is a scenario where we have a number of users, uh, each of whom holds a private input. And actually, I've only drawn four, five users here, but think really about the case where we have uh, tens of thousands or even potentially hundreds of thousands of users in a very large uh, system. And what we want to do is we want to be able to compute some statistics over the inputs of these users <clears throat> while maintaining privacy to the extent possible. And just as a particular example, you can think, if you like, of computing the mean of their inputs. But of course, it could be more general statistics as well. And uh, one approach that people have turned to to try to address this problem is uh, secure multi-party computation. but I'll also abbreviate by uh, MPC. And this basically defines an interactive protocol uh, run among the parties, some multi-round interactive protocol, okay, where all the parties may communicate with each other, uh, at the end of which the uh, parties, either all of them or maybe one individual party, and actually for our purposes, let's assume that we just have one uh, specific party uh, who should learn the output, and we'll sometimes refer to that as uh, as the server, and the server um, may not have input in that case, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes. 
Um, at the end of this computation, at the end of running this distributed protocol, uh, that server will have the result of the computation. And what secure multi-party computation can guarantee is that a real world execution of the protocol is indistinguishable from an ideal computation of some function, some function f. And so what we can think about is that even though we have in the real world, these parties executing some interactive protocol, um, because of the cryptographic guarantees of secure multi-party computation, we can imagine that that is equivalent to a situation where the parties all have access to an ideal trusted entity who's computing a function f on their behalf. Whoops, so this should actually be the different parties. Uh, each holding their inputs. And in this ideal execution, what the parties will do is they'll just simply send their inputs to this trusted entity. Uh, that trusted entity will then compute the function. So for example, that function might be the function that computes the average of the inputs that it receives. Uh, it computes the output value y, and then simply sends that value back in this case to the uh, first party who's playing the role of the server. Now in this ideal execution, right, assuming that the trusted entity computing the function f is really trustworthy and cannot be compromised, um, we can see that we get a number of guarantees here. So first of all, we get the guarantee that the server learns the output y, but learns nothing else about the inputs of the parties. And that's gonna be the case even if some number of these parties are corrupted. So for example, even if say uh, we have party two and party five are corrupted. Uh, and even if they're colluding perhaps with the server playing the role of party one, all they can learn from this execution is the output value Y and they learn nothing about the input of player four, the input X four of player four in this case. And we have very powerful feasibility results for secure computation. Uh, in this talk, I'm only gonna be focusing on the semi-honest setting where the parties are gonna be assumed to do everything that they're told uh, honestly. And the only question is whether or not they can learn more than they're allowed to from their view during the execution of the protocol. And for semi-honest security, uh, we know that we can compute any function F securely, even if up to all but one of the parties are corrupted. So secure computation uh, of any function f is possible. This is under suitable cryptographic assumptions. Uh, and this is going to be secure as I said, even against n minus one corruptions. So I'll use uh, n throughout to denote the number of parties in the system. So that's great. So we have these broad feasibility results for secure computation. Uh, and if, if, we are, if we're interested in computing the mean of the party's inputs, then we can simply do that. And the question is, does this solve the problem? Um, and it's, it doesn't really solve the entire problem. And the reason for that is that secure computation fundamentally tells us, given a function f, how to compute that function securely, right? We imagine that we want to compute some function f. It would be great if we had this ideal world, this trusted with, with, with this trusted uh, entity that could compute f on our behalf. And secure computation protocols allow us to emulate that ideal world via a real world execution of the protocol. So again, that's telling us how to compute this function f. But how do we decide in the first place that f is the right function to compute? And more generally, how do we know that the function f itself is actually a safe function to compute. And this example I've been talking about regarding uh, computation of the mean of the party's inputs provides a great example of why secure computation may not be enough. So if we have a situation where n minus one of the parties are corrupted, so say everybody except for player four, then we can construct a secure computation protocol that will guarantee that the computation of the mean 
via that protocol is going to be as secure as computation of the mean in the ideal world. But in the ideal world, if we know all but one of the inputs, and then we learn the mean of all the inputs, then we can simply calculate from that the remaining party's input. Okay, so even though we're able to compute the function f securely, computation of that function in the ideal world already leaks too much information. And so we need another uh, approach, a different approach besides secure computation that will tell us in the first place what functions uh, are safe to compute. So I can summarize this by just saying that secure computation tells us perhaps how to compute some function. But we need another mechanism in order to tell us what functions we should be computing, what functions are safe to compute. And for that, we have another technique that's been developed in the cryptographic community over the last decade or so, uh, which is called differential privacy. Uh, so this provides a way to determine uh, what functions let's say, uh, are safe to compute or private to compute. So just like I said a moment ago, uh, computing the mean would be a bad example, would be a, a function that's not safe to compute because that would reveal information about the, finals party, the final party's input if all but one of the inputs uh, are known. So let me give a, a definition of differential privacy because it'll be relevant to what I'm gonna be talking about. So differential privacy was traditionally defined for um, a centralized mechanism, and I'll talk about different models for differential privacy in a minute. But if we have a mechanism M, say that's mapping some set of inputs from some domain D, so we have N inputs all in domain D, um, and outputting a value in some range R. And we'll say that this mechanism M is epsilon delta differentially private if for all neighboring inputs, and I'll say what neighboring is in a moment. So these are vectors of inputs. Uh, and all sets of output R, um, let me call it R prime. It should hold that the probability that MX is in R prime is roughly close to the probability that MX prime is in R prime. Okay, where closeness is measured by uh, a multiplicative term, uh, e to the epsilon and then a small additive term, uh, delta. And you can think of uh, epsilon as being a small constant, maybe about one, uh, and delta as being some, some small, but perhaps not negligible quantity. Uh, in practice, it might be two to the, tw two to the minus 20, two to the minus 40. If you, if you want cryptographic security guarantees, you might take it to be two to the minus 60, but it's some smaller uh, additive factor. <clears throat> And I, uh, let me come back to this uh, term neighboring. So what does neighboring mean? So neighboring is defined to be two vectors that are equal in all but one position. So X and X prime differ in only a single position. And what this is providing here is a guarantee that even if all but one of the inputs are known and say only the uh, input of party I is not known. So X and X prime are equal everywhere except that they differ on the input of party I. Then even so, the result of running the mechanism on inputs X and x prime should be very close to each other. And again, where closeness is measured by this uh, expression over here. And it, as you can see, right, computing the mean exactly is not gonna satisfy this definition because if you compute the mean exactly, then changing any one party's input is gonna completely change uh, the distribution of the result. And so uh, the mechanism M inherently has to be randomized. And so what we might do instead is rather than computing the mean, uh, exactly what we would do is compute the mean with some small amount of noise. And uh, the, the, the um, uh, <clears throat> differential privacy tells us exactly how to determine that noise in order to meet this uh, particular guarantee. <clears throat> okay, 
So as I said a moment ago, uh, differential privacy was traditionally considered in uh, a model where there was some centralized trusted authority uh, that would compute this mechanism M. And so uh, actually I can just draw really the same kind of picture I had it before, um, where now this is no longer in a way an idealized model. This is now actually the way that differential privacy was meant to be uh, done in the real world. The idea was that you had some curator uh, who would take data from all the parties Uh, the curator is trusted to hold or to see the data of all the parties. And then after receiving the, the inputs from all the parties, that curator would simply output the result of running the mechanism on the vector of inputs provided by those parties. And the point here again, is that even if we completely trust this curator to, uh, to, to see all the inputs and to execute the mechanism faithfully, we still have to be concerned about the fact that we're releasing uh, M of X to the world. And we wanna make sure that that uh, mechanism that revealing that value m of x doesn't reveal too much information about parties' inputs, even to an adversary who may know all but one uh, of the uh, of the parties' inputs. So this is the so-called centralized model for differential privacy. Now, of course, right, being cryptographers and being people who work in information security, we know that we don't want to uh, put all of our trust in one party. And so people then look for other ways to achieve differential privacy without having to trust this centralized uh, authority to compute everything. So if I call this this here is the centralized model. And people then also considered uh, a local model of differential privacy, uh, where now you'll have a trusted entity like before. The parties will have inputs like before. But now rather than sending their exact inputs to the, uh, the central authority, what each party will do is add its own local noise to its input before sending it on to that trusted party. So each party uh, locally will run some randomizer to get a value y, uh, y1 up to yn. And then they'll send that noisy input uh, to the central authority who can then compute some function m again on the inputs that it receives. Okay, now on the y vector. And the point here is that we can ensure, we can set things up to ensure that even uh, we achieve differential privacy against this central authority itself. So meaning that if we just focus on, uh, and again, even if we assume that this trusted authority or some adversary knows the inputs of all but one of the parties, just seeing the value say y1 from party one is not gonna to reveal too much information about its input x1. And that's again measured by the same uh, differential privacy, privacy guarantee as before, although now the mechanism that we're gonna be looking at is the local randomizer that party one applies to its own input. Okay, unfortunately, so this is a great model from the point of view of trust because it, it distributes trust among all the parties. Parties don't have to trust anybody except themselves. However, uh, it was unfortunately shown that there are some limits on the utility of what we can obtain in this model. And in particular, well, just to give one example, uh, when computing the mean, it's possible to compute the mean in the centralized model with uh, only constant amount of noise. Uh, but in the local model, it's known that uh, square root of n noise is required. So this is basically giving us limits on what we can achieve. It's kind of a trade-off between the utility that we can hope to achieve and the privacy that we're uh, being guaranteed here. So a couple of years back, people proposed an intermediate notion of differential privacy, or, or a model, I should say, of how to achieve differential privacy, uh, called the shuffle model. And in this model, what's assumed is that we have some trusted entity as before, but we also have an intermediary layer between the parties and that trusted authority. So I'll draw it like this, and I'll say in a moment what it's gonna do. The parties, as before, are gonna have their inputs, x1 through xn. They're going to, as before, apply some local randomizer to their inputs in order to obtain noisy versions of their inputs, y1 through yn. And then what this intermediate uh, entity is going to do, it's gonna to serve to shuffle 
the inputs that it receives. So what does it mean to shuffle them? Well, it just means to mix them all together, to, uh, to basically um, uh, to anonymize them so that the information about which Y value comes from which user is hidden. And so then it just sends, uh, let's call it a set now of YI values, where again, the YI values are all gonna be forwarded to that central authority, but information about which Y value came from which user is now hidden. So just think of them as being perhaps randomly permuted before being sent on to the trusted authority. And it turns out actually that just adding this one layer of shuffling can improve significantly the amount of utility that can be achieved while still ensuring differential privacy against, um, uh, against the central authority. Okay. And if you like actually to think about uh, a, a particular example uh, of a mechanism in the shuffle model, uh, which actually also is inherited from the local model, um, there's a simple mechanism called a randomized response that's been used actually uh, without having the notion of differential privacy to back it up, but it was used even way back in the, um, in, in the 50s uh, for survey responses. Uh, and the idea there is that basically uh, what you do is if you have some input value X, then with some uh, non-zero probability, what you're gonna do is you're going to uh, just delete your input and replace it by a random value. And with the remaining probability, you'll send your actual value. So think of, you know, just as, as, a, as one example, maybe with 75% probability, you send your actual input value, but with the remaining 25% of the probability, you'll just pick a uniform value in the domain and send that instead. And that does give you some protection even in the local model, um, but, it, but you can show that it gives you even stronger protection for the same uh, set of probabilities uh, if you work in the shuffle model. Or another way of saying that is that you can actually use a lot less noise in that randomized response mechanism and still get good differential privacy uh, even in the shuffle model. And there's even a general result actually um, that says that if you have any mechanism, uh, R, so this is now a local mechanism that the parties run on their own. That is epsilon differentially private in the local setting. Is roughly epsilon over square root of n uh, delta differentially private in the shuffle model. Okay, so you're actually getting a significant reduction in the epsilon, which is determining the amount of privacy you're getting. So smaller epsilon is better. And you're getting a reduction by roughly a square root in the number of parties. So I'm, I'm, I'm hiding some low order terms here, but basically you get a reduction uh, of square root of n uh, in the, in the um, well, you get an improvement in the privacy by roughly a square root of n. And when the number of parties is large, as I said earlier, this can be quite significant. Now it's interesting to kind of think of these two uh, different areas of research, secure computation and differential privacy uh, in light of each other, right? You can view these different models for differential privacy as kind of minimal interaction protocols. Okay, so clearly in the, in the case of the uh, centralized model where we just have this authority receiving inputs from the parties, replacing all of our trust in that one, in that one entity. Uh, in the local model, right, we don't have to trust anybody. We can do that as kind of a fully secure type of differentially private protocol. Um, uh, but what's interesting about it is that it's only one round of communication and all the communication is going from the parties uh, to the central authority. And then here we've added an intermediate layer uh, an intermediate entity, if you like to think of it as that, um, which is collecting inputs from the parties and then just doing the simple task of shuffling them before forwarding, forwarding them on to the, um, uh, to the curator. So I see there's a question. I don't know if it's, uh, if, we, if we want to, uh, let's see if I, can, if I can view it actually. Um, right, so uh, that's actually interesting about what, what you can compute and what the bounds are and what you can compute in the shuffle model. So clearly the shuffle model um, uh, it can do anything that you can do in the local model. And maybe the question then is, can you do things, are, are there things that you can do in the centralized model that you cannot do in the shuffle model? And I, and I don't think we have, um, I, I don't know of any example uh, of that. I know that there is a separation between the local model uh, and the centralized model. Uh, but I don't, I don't know of any such separation between the uh, shuffle model and the, um, and the centralized model. There are also more complicated versions of the shuffle model as well. 
uh, that I'm not going to discuss here. So I see. Okay. Um, good. So um, another way we can try to distribute trust here, right? If we go back to our original problem, which was that we that we want to use the centralized model, perhaps, but we don't want to trust the curator. Well, a natural thing we can try to do is to try to uh, use the secure computation protocols that we've talked about earlier to try to instantiate the curator. Right? What we can do, again, is we can view the curator as an ideal functionality computing this mechanism M. And we can then imagine designing a secure computation protocol for computing the function M. Uh, alternately, right, what we could do is we can try to instantiate the shuffle model using a secure computation protocol. So what we would be doing there is we would be uh, replacing the shuffler right, who was this semi-trusted or trusted entity doing the shuffling for the parties, we could try to replace that by a secure computation protocol. And a key observation here, right, is that if you do either of those, so either replacing the uh, curator itself, right, uh, or replacing the uh, shuffler with a secure computation protocol, that will certainly work, but it may be overkill, right? Why would it be overkill? Because in the end, what we're achieving is uh, a relaxation of perfect security, of perfect privacy. We're achieving uh, only epsilon uh, epsil or epsilon delta differential privacy, which means that the attacker is learning some small amount of information about parties' inputs. And so it's overkill to then use general secure multi-party computation, which will basically try to hide all information about parties' inputs. And so what we can hope to do then is we can hope to use, I'll call it lightweight, secure computation to instantiate uh, either the curator in the centralized model uh, or the shuffler in the, um, uh, in the shuffle model while still achieving our ultimate goal of differential privacy. Okay, and that's the question we're going to be looking at uh, here. And we're not the first to ask this question. We're not the first to notice that using general secure computation uh, might be overkill. Although it is interesting to note that there's been relatively little progress uh, in this direction. So I really only know of, of maybe uh, two or three examples of where uh, people have shown how it's possible to use lightweight secure computation protocols that is something more efficient than a, than a fully secure uh, MPC protocol in order to get a result about differential privacy uh, for some uh, computation that they're, that's being carried out. Um, and so in particular, what I wanted, what I wanted to look at is um, how we can replace the shuffler in the shuffle model of differential privacy with some, again, lightweight secure computation protocol that'll, uh, that'll implement the shuffle uh, on behalf of the parties. And so in particular, if we look at the case of doing that, then known protocols So known fully secure MPC protocols for shuffling uh, all require uh, N squared communication. Okay, and so what we'd like, so of course, as I'm, as I said, you can immediately instantiate the shuffle model by replacing the shuffler with a secure shuffling protocol run among the parties themselves. But all known approaches for doing that via a fully secure shuffling protocol would incur quadratic communication costs. And we'd like to see whether we can uh, do better. So one way to think about this, again, kind of blending differential privacy and secure computation, is that in some ideal world, in some hybrid world rather, where we have these parties and they have access to the shuffler, as a trusted entity. So again, they can each send noisy versions of their inputs to the shuffler. And then the shuffler, we can imagine just even outputs the resulting multi-set YI uh, for everybody to see. Uh, what we'd like to know how to do is to replace that shuffler with a protocol that's run among the parties. So we want to replace 
the shuffler by a protocol that still ensures differential privacy. And I won't write it, but let me just say that you can define differential privacy for a protocol uh, in a natural way. So if you have T corrupted parties, which will include uh, also the server who receives the final output, then what we'll say is that the view of the parties in executing the protocol should satisfy the differential privacy guarantee. So namely, if we change any one of the inputs of the parties, then the distribution on the views of the corrupted parties in running the protocol should only change by this E to the epsilon factor plus perhaps a small, uh, a small delta. And so what we show in our work is first of all, a definition for shuffling, for a shuffling protocol called uh, differential obliviousness. Uh, we then prove that this definition uh, suffices or basically composes nicely for differential privacy. And then we give a construction of a differentially oblivious shuffling protocol with uh, n log n communication. So basically beating what's known for uh, fully secure shuffling protocols. So let me jump uh, right to the definition. Uh, so first of all, I'll just observe that, so we're, we're looking at shuffling protocols. So a shuffling protocol is a protocol, um, the functionality that that protocol is computing is now a deterministic functionality. It's taking inputs from the party. So the inputs here are gonna be the YI values, the randomized values that the parties send. Uh, but what, we're, what the shuffling protocol is gonna do is simply uh, take input YI from each party and then output this multi-set uh, of the Y values that were contributed. So the main point is that you're breaking the linkage between the, um, the values that are contributed and the parties who contributed those values. Uh, and so differential privacy or some version of differential privacy is not really gonna work here at all because if you change one of the input values, then you're going to uh, change the output value. So we're computing a deterministic function here uh, and so the output alone is going to reveal whether or not you were working on one input, one input vector X or a second input vector X prime. And so differential privacy is just not the right notion here. And so what we came up with instead is, like I said, this notion called differential obliviousness. And the key there is to look at or, or to define really neighboring inputs, not in terms of an input value that's changed, but in terms of the transposition of two users inputs. So uh, what we say here is that uh, a shuffling protocol is epsilon delta differentially oblivious. Uh, let me say for T corrupted users, and if for all uh, transposed inputs, or let me say it differently, for all vectors uh, x and x prime that are transpositions of each other, so again, what does it mean to be a transposition? It just means that we've taken the inputs of two parties i and j and swapped them. So for all x and x prime that are transpositions of each other uh, and all sets of views V, we now have the probability that the view of the corrupted parties, right? Which includes the output being computed by the shuffling, but the outputs are the same in this case, right? Because x and x prime 
uh, are the same are the same set of inputs. They're just uh, transpositions of each other. So the probability then that the view of the corrupted parties when running the protocol on inputs x lies in the set v is less than e to the epsilon times the probability that the view of the parties run on x prime is in v plus delta. And the theorem, so I'll just observe, right, that any fully secure shuffling protocol will satisfy this definition, but this is weaker than the notion of secure computation because secure computation in particular uh, would require, uh, first of all, it would not allow the e to the epsilon factor. Uh, and second of all, secure computation would require indistinguishability, even if the vectors, the two input vectors are arbitrary permutations of each other, not, not simply transpositions. Um, but what we can show is that if we have some um, mechanism, so let me write it this way. We have some local randomizer run by the parties, given access to an ideal shuffle. So this represents the execution of some protocol in uh, some hybrid model where the parties locally run this randomizer to randomize their inputs and then send that to some ideal functionality implementing the shuffle on their behalf. So if this version of the shuffling protocol is epsilon delta differentially private, and then we have some protocol sigma that's a shuffle protocol which satisfies differential obliviousness, say epsilon prime delta prime differentially oblivious, then when we compose these two, so we look at now the real world protocol where the parties locally run R and then run protocol sigma to do the shuffling. is epsilon plus epsilon prime, delta plus def, uh, delta, delta prime differentially private. Okay, so this holds actually right for any, uh, uh, any protocol, be, any differentially private protocol being run in the shuffle model. This shows that if we take a protocol sigma that satisfies our notion of differential obliviousness, then that will suffice for claiming that the composition of these, right, where again, every party runs locally, it's, it's, it's this randomizer to randomize their input and then runs the shuffle protocol to get the shuffled result of all their, of all their noisy inputs, that protocol will satisfy uh, differential privacy. And uh, I, I'm not gonna have time to go through the proof. It's actually quite a, a, a technical proof, really. Uh, let me just say the high level intuition. Uh, the high level intuition is really to argue, uh, to break what's going on, to break this composed protocol here into two pieces. Uh, first, look at the uh, noisy value, the noisy inputs, the Y values that are being submitted to uh, the shuffler uh, or the shuffle protocol, and to argue that the distribution on those inputs has to be close uh, because of the fact that the original uh, protocol in the shuffle model was differentially private. And then argue that if you condition on the output result, uh, so if you fix some particular output that results from the shuffling, um, then it must be the case that you can um, map each one of the Y vectors of, of noisy inputs that are provided in the case that the true inputs came from the vector X to a corresponding vector of Y values uh, that, that occurred from the case when the original input vector of the parties was X prime. Uh, and then you rely on the differential obliviousness of the shuffling protocol to argue that, that uh, you, can, you can view those as transpositions of each other. And therefore the view of the adversary or the view of the corrupted parties in running the protocol is gonna be very close uh, in each of those. So let me leave it at that. I'll go, I'll go on to the, the it's, it's a little, like I said, a bit technical to show this. Uh, and so I'd rather focus on the uh, shuffling protocol that we construct itself. But anyway, this is nice because it shows a, a general way of instantiating the shuffle model via some, um, let's say shuffling protocol that satisfies a weaker notion of security than full security that would be required by, uh, by a multi-party computation. So if there are any, any questions until this point? There were no questions from the attendees yet. Okay, yeah, great. Um, so let's look now at how we can construct a shuffling protocol. And the protocol that we construct actually 
uh, I think is a, is a relatively simple protocol, but the analysis it can be quite intricate. So the basic idea, what we're gonna do to implement the shuffling protocol is to use uh, onion routing. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with this. This is a technique that's been used uh, for, for a while. Actually, it's used inside the, uh, the Tor system. Uh, but but uh, in Tor, there's only a limited number of hops. We're gonna consider, consider onion routing with a much larger number of hops. Um, the basic idea of onion routing is that we have say one party, let's just focus on one party who has an input value, uh, call it Y, right? Because that's gonna correspond to the noisy version of their true input that they're gonna be submitting as input to the shuffling protocol. Um, and that party knows, of course, that there are all these other parties out there uh, in the system. And what they're going to do is they're going to pick some number of parties uh, at random. So in general, if we have um, an R hop uh, onion routing protocol, what this party will do is it will choose R other parties uniformly at random from the set of parties. And then it's gonna start encrypting or forming nested encryptions of its input value Y. So just as an example, if I have a two hop system, then what I might have is if I label this party say um, P2, and over here we have a party P3, and let's say we'll also put in the server as a designated party out here. So then what uh, this party P1 holding the input value Y is gonna do, it's gonna form say an encryption under the key of P2 of an encryption under the key of P3 uh, of its value y. Actually, I should have left room because there's gonna be another encryption uh, under the server's key. Okay. Uh, and then given this ciphertext, this nested uh, ciphertext, which is why it's called an onion. Um, oh, I got it wrong here. Let me give myself a little more room and write it correctly. So the server encryption is gonna to have to be on the inside. So we're gonna have encryption under P2. Okay, so we encrypt first under the server, then under P3, then in, in, under P2. Okay, it's gonna send that ciphertext on to P2. Uh, P2 is then able to strip off the outer layer of the encryption and it will forward the remainder, right, which is now an encryption under P3 of an encryption under the server's key of the value Y, it forwards that to P3. P3 can strip off now the second layer of the encryption and then forward to the server an encryption under the server's public key of the value Y. And the server can then decrypt and just recover that value Y. And if we imagine now that every party in the system is gonna be doing this, they're gonna be choosing independently our random users and routing their message Y through those R random users until, they're, until they're, that will be received by the server, then this provides a way after the server decrypts all those messages uh, to recover exactly the uh, N input values, the Y values of those parties, but without knowing, right, at least, I mean, without, without, without having corrupted some parties in the system anyway, it wouldn't have any way of knowing um, which values came from which user. So this exactly implements the functionality that we want. This implements the shuffle. And now the question is, what can we say about its security? Keeping in mind that we also have some corrupted users in the system. So it might be the case, for example, that P3 is corrupted. Uh, maybe I should color it in red. So maybe P3 is corrupted and maybe this party here is corrupted and we'll treat the server as corrupted as well. And we want to guarantee somehow that even if there are some number of corrupted parties in the network, they can't learn uh, or, they, or they can't fully learn the mapping between user inputs and the actual Y values that were received, okay? So the question then is what can we say about the differential obliviousness uh, of this protocol as a function of the number of hops uh, of onion routing that we're using? So let me just let uh, R, whoops. So we're gonna have, again, every user is gonna pick uh, R hops. Or we're gonna pick R random users in the system and they're gonna route their message in this way uh, to the server. And so let me just actually, since we'll have it here, 
Uh, if every user is doing that, then we have order of n times r messages in the system because every user is responsible for r messages that are being sent. Actually, it's exactly uh, n times r. And where do we pick up the log n factor? Well, basically, I didn't. I hid something in the onion encryption because we would actually have to specify the identities of the parties that we're sending to. Um, we need some way for P2, for example, to know that it's supposed to forward on the message to P3. And that adds another uh, log n overhead. So we basically get order of n r log n communication. And we'll see in a moment that setting r constant uh, will be enough for us to get good security. So what's one way we can analyze this? So remember what we're trying to prove here is that this protocol using onion routing for all the parties is going to achieve differential obliviousness. So that means we need to consider two different vectors of inputs that are transposed. So we may as well assume that parties one and two say are the users whose inputs are transposed. So let's actually just focus on users P1 and P2. And we want to understand, right, if we have the server over here who's receiving the um, uh, ultimately the value y1 from p1 and y2 from p2, that basically the server shouldn't be able to tell whether y1 came from p1 and y2 came from p2 or, or vice versa, whether y2 came from p1 and whether y1 came from p2. And we can assume here that uh, the, the server even knows all the other values of the, of the inputs of the other parties in the system. Um, we'll also assume some number of parties that are doing the onion routing are gonna be corrupted and let's see what we can guarantee. So first imagine, right, let, let's try to think about this conceptually. Um, let's just look at say the first hop taken by the uh, encrypted message sent by P1 and by P2. And let's imagine, say, that the first hop from P1 happens to end up at a corrupted party. Okay, So then that corrupted party knows that it received in the first round a message, an encrypted message from P1. Okay, It can't decrypt that message uh, because it does not know all the keys of all the parties that were used in the onion encryption by P1. Uh, this will follow from the, what, the bound we're going to show. Um, but again, it can link, even if the next hop is to an honest party, that malicious party can now link the incoming message that it received from P1 with the outgoing message that it sent to some other party, some other even honest party in the system. Okay, so we're not going to get any anonymity from that hop because it went via a malicious party. However, okay, if we imagine say that P1 and P2 uh, both are lucky enough to choose, say in their second and third hops, honest parties. So these black users represent honest parties. Then even if the rest of the parties in the chain that are being used in the rest of the hops are malicious, and even if the attacker can then see the links between incoming and outgoing messages at both of those hops before they're forwarded to the server, I claim that the presence of this four tuple of honest users here is going to be sufficient to completely randomize uh, which input corresponds to P1 and which input corresponds to P2. And why is that? Because within those four honest parties, the attacker doesn't know uh, the linkages between the incoming and the outgoing messages. And so it's equally likely that the messages went like that, or that in fact the messages were crossed like this. So even if we give the attacker uh, the information that P1 and P2's messages were routed exactly through these four users in rounds uh, two and three, <clears throat> the attacker still does not know whether P1's message followed the top path and P2's followed the bottom path, or whether inside that circle of four honest users, the messages from parties P1 and P2 were flipped. <clears throat> And so what that means is that as long as the parties have a situation where this occurs, where in two consecutive rounds, they each pick uh, honest users for their hops, um, then the server will have no information about which input corresponds to uh, P1 and which input corresponds to P2. So now it's just a matter of calculating the probability that this occurs as a function of the number of hops uh, R that we set as a parameter of the protocol. And so um, I guess I, I won't go through the calculation because I want to leave time for something else. Uh, 
But um, it's not actually a difficult calculation because the probability that P1 uh, and P2 both choose honest intermediaries in any round uh, J is going to be constant if we assume a constant fraction of the parties in the network are corrupted. So let's just say for the sake of example that exactly one third uh, of the parties are corrupted, then the probability that they both choose honest intermediaries in round J is going to be two thirds squared. Okay. And now we want to calculate the probability that there exists a pair of consecutive rounds, J and J plus one, where they each pick um, honest users. And we can view this as um, a, a game where we flip a coin over a sequence of R rounds. And we're interested in the problem, and, and, the, and the coin will come up heads with probability two thirds squared equals four nines. And what we're interested in is the probability that at some point within that sequence of coin tosses, we have two heads in a row. And this is something that you can calculate and get lower bounds on. And I'll just give uh, the kind of final result that the probability, uh, this is for uh, one third corrupted, the probability uh, that we have, let me just call it good, which is this event here when we have four honest users in a square like that, the probability of event good uh, occurring is uh, at least one minus 0 0.85 to the R. So the probability that good does not occur is decaying exponentially in R. And you can use that to set R appropriately in order to drive down the probability of failure uh, as low as you like. Let me just leave, I see I have only about five or six minutes left. Uh, let me just um, uh, summarize what we have here and then just so quickly, what else you can show in the analysis. So what this shows here is that whenever this good event occurs, then we get perfect privacy. So uh, the server has no information about whether P1s or P2s inputs, uh, which one of those values corresponds to Y1 and which one corresponds to Y2. That corresponds to an epsilon value of zero, which is the best privacy you can achieve. And so this basically will tell you that the shuffling protocol is something like zero, uh, 0.85 to the R differentially oblivious. And so um, th this is still better uh, if we set R to some constant value to achieve say two to the minus 40 or two to the minus 60 for Delta, this will still give us a better uh, protocol than a fully secure protocol for shuffling. But we might even be able to do better by further relaxing things and tolerating an epsilon greater than zero. And so I'll just briefly sketch uh, in what cases you might be able to get epsilon greater than zero, uh, just to give you a, a, you know kind of a hint as to what um, uh, basically the complexity of the analysis here. So we considered above this probability that P1 and P2 directly swap, but we can also consider a swap of their inputs that occurs via some intermediate party P3 in the system. And uh, the way this might work is that we have, for example, a situation where P1 and P3 have, actually, I'm going to just simplify things. I'm going to write this as a crossbar here. So this just corresponds to the event, actually, where P1 and P3 both chose honest intermediaries for two consecutive rounds. And so their inputs may or may not have been swapped. Uh, and then we might have P2 and P3 at some later point in time, also having the ability to do a swap. And then again, at some later point in time, it could be many rounds later, P1 and P3 may swap again. And you can see in this picture that even though P1 and P2 have no ability to directly swap their messages, there's a possibility that P1 and P2 can effectively end up swapping via the intermediate uh, node P3. Um, and even though this is now a lower probability event, because we need this good event to occur now, uh, at three different places along the execution. Um, but the fact is that we can also sum now over all the other users in the system. So here I was focusing on P3, but we actually have you know, N users in the system or order of N users if we only look at honest users. And so we can actually take that into account and show bounds here on uh, what kind of obliviousness this gives, um, uh, even when we don't have a direct swap between P1 and P2. And that allows us to set R smaller while achieving um, similar levels of privacy as before. And, and let me just conclude actually with two words and then I see there are some questions and I'm happy to take those in a minute. 
um, getting actually a tight analysis of the uh, epsilon delta differential obliviousness provided by um, the onion routing protocol is still open. We've basically analyzed these two cases uh, and shown kind of um, uh, technically incomparable results about the privacy that can be achieved, but getting some tight bounds on the epsilon delta differential obliviousness achieved is still open. It's really uh, becomes a very intricate probability type problem. Um, and I think more generally, trying to come up with other protocols for the specific case of uh, differentially oblivious shuffling, uh, perhaps getting an O of N communication protocol or proving a lower bound would also be really interesting. And more generally looking at other examples of where you can use lightweight secure computation protocols that don't achieve the definition of full security uh, and get better complexity than what's known, uh, but suffice for differential privacy is still a very interesting uh, direction. So I think with that, I'll, I'll just stop and I'll uh, take some of the questions. I think I can even see them in the chat perhaps. Um, I see just about the synchronization. Yeah, so the assumption, I mean, it doesn't actually matter um, uh, whether they're synchronized or not, I have to think about it. I, I don't think it actually matters, but at least mentally, I'm thinking about it as as being as happening in a synchronous network. Notice that you know all we need actually is that the party that receives a message knows what um, uh, what hop it, it's in, and even that you barely need to know. All it needs to do is to look at the next destination, strip off the last layer of encryption, and then forward it on. Uh, and so the synchronization is not actually that strong of an assumption. Although I suppose that if you had some, um, you might be able to leak information. If you, knew, if you happen to know something about timing of different messages in the network, that may leak other information, uh, but I don't think it, offhand, I don't think it does. Um, so are there any, any other questions?